Hey guys, welcome to the London Lift Podcast. Today we've got a great episode in store for you. We're going to discuss six common strength training mistakes. I think getting stronger is probably one of the most common performance related goals in the gym. And there's a few things that we see commonly uh, done wrong or yeah. done not as well as they could be. So we're going to run you through our list of six. In our Hopefully, opinion. Yeah, in our opinion, plenty of caveats throughout the episode. <laughs> but Hopefully they'll be helpful and hopefully you can tweak your training or your client's training to get them stronger, more efficiently. But before we get into it, as always, a quick thank you to our show sponsors, thetrainingstimulus.com. We've just upgraded the Movement Mechanics Mentorship Program. So if you're a coach, PT or healthcare professional wanting to get a next level understanding of movement, please check out the website to learn more. Also to wit-fitness.com. Please check out the website for all your WIT kit and use discount code LL15 to get 15% off your purchase. Hytro for all your blood flow restriction apparel, use discount code LL20 to get 20% off. Right, let's get into it. Strength, Rob, this is your forte. Hmm. That's what I love. So shall we make some caveats to start with? <laughs> yes, I think that's important. Um, I think for me, the most important thing is that individual circumstances may vary so this doesn't mean this is necessarily your limiter. It could be the opposite to some of these things, but these are the most common patterns that we tend to see. And depending on your experience, training age, any injuries, um, the answers could be different, but these are the most common patterns that we tend to see. So don't take them as gospel, just- But take them into consideration. Because yeah. I think our first point is one that gets really commonly mistaken because there's when it comes into the strength well first point is bodybuilding not strength training now i know i've i've even said this in the past as well where you know trying to find an eight rep max 10 rep max because of crossfit and stuff is like you know we want to try and build our capacity for these high loads or your 20 rep max squat anyone that's done that before knows how killer that is but if we're talking about strength we do need to i guess identify what is our measure of strength is it a 10 rep max back squat or is it a one rep max back squat? And understanding between the two. And the reason why I say this is because when you start going up the rep ranges to eight reps plus, you're starting to go more into that bodybuilding muscle growth, recruiting exercise volume. Yeah. Whereas when we're on the lower end of spectrum, where you're going anywhere from say one to say six, maybe to eight, but say one to six, we're looking at more strength biased recruitment and goal so understanding what your individual goal is if it's powerlifting nice and clear cut one rep max on the main list and i think even in crossfit your strength probably your one rep max on x amount of lifts but then you mm. also need to take into consideration your strength in your three rep max your five rep max your 10 rep max so there's this is why crossfit is quite a tricky thing to kind of program for because it, you're trying yeah. to cover so many bases so the to identify what your strength metric is, is pretty challenging. Yeah, I think that's a really important caveat. And we, we did an episode a while back, I think it was called The Art and Science of Strength Training, where mm. we get into the definitions of strength. And there is no one definition for what, what strong means to every individual out there. You need to get clear on what getting stronger means to you. But this bodybuilding and not strength training point is quite broad in that it could be the rep ranges are too high there's a big focus on time under tension which could hold back the amount of weight that you're able to lift if you are focused on the lower rep ranges which is a more traditional view of what strength is but as rob says in a sport like crossfit strength endurance is also really important so having a higher 20 rep max might actually improve your crossfit performance better mm. but wouldn't be considered such a pure measure of strength as a one rep max. For me, the bodybuilding not strength training point extends a little bit more into having a bigger emphasis on individual muscles mm. rather than an overall movement pattern. So if we're talking about a squat and people start doing really isolated like calf, quad, hamstring work, those movements were designed to for hypertrophy in those muscles. And I'm not saying that there's going to be no carryover whatsoever and it might not help some people in some circumstances. But as we said at the start, 
for the majority of people and the most common pattern is that you're spending time, energy and your recovery budget on growing these individual muscles and training them out of sequence yeah. with the rest of the body, which is a really important uh, point on the strength um, front is that the coordination and muscle sequencing and skill of the movement is a huge driver of performance. So if you're spending your time trying to grow individual muscles and fire them out of sequence with the rest of the body, then that's time you could have spent getting better at the skill of the movement you're actually trying to get better at. And yeah. I think time is limited, recovery is limited, so spend it wisely. Yeah, so I guess this is where obviously like exercise selection is key. And like when your accessories for your main lifts is in how close when you're uh, going up the scale of spectrum of specif specificity I nearly got it in one um when you're going through that spectrum and you're thinking cool okay so for the deadlift and you're then doing a romanian deadlift as an accessory to that that is very close to the main lift because it's very similar bar the final part of a little bit of knee flexion and then hitting the floor so mm -hmm. it's very close to the main movement so then you're going to be able to keep the the say the accessory volume for the main lift in the right place mm. rather than necessarily getting to then say doing some like lying hamstring curls where then you it is purely looking at say growing the muscle and, get, and maybe improving that my muscle connection which then might in turn help with your say your deadlift however maybe getting better at the romanian deadlift would be a much better point of call to get you better hamstring recruitment and glute recruitment and lower back midline all of this stuff when it comes to the deadlift itself so then so really coming back to that bodybuilding not strength training just have a clear focus on your training and one of the key things is not taking your stuff to failure especially if you're mm. in the strength training world because there is just no need to stress a position continuously because you want to be able to recover and come back quicker rather than taking a muscle yeah. to compete failure which is great when you're looking for say muscle growth and you know taking sets of failure is absolutely amazing this is also where you know th having things like blood flow restriction can be really beneficial that if you do want to throw in that kind of stuff safely without it's a nice way to do it but staying away from failure is key thing when you're looking to build total strength yeah massive massive point i think and and it's a big distinction from bodybuilding to strength training where one of the drivers for hypertrophy is muscle damage so we're actively looking to rip up those muscles to give the stimulus for them to grow and repair bigger for next time however size isn't a consideration for pure strength like if, mm. if all you care about is lifting the most kilos on the bar then you shouldn't be preoccupied with looking bigger if, if that's the mm. pure focus of your training and i'm not saying that's what it should be but if we're talking about optimizing for strength failure is a blocker to getting stronger faster like if you damage those muscles your performance will be negatively impacted short term you'll be so sore the muscles will be damaged so you won't be able to do any more strength training for one two three days any productive strength training mm. whereas if you get your heavy reps done without hitting failure you get a strength stimulus and you can probably train again sooner and do more total volume over a week or over a month which actually will result in you getting stronger faster than burying yourself on one day in particular and being so sore that you reduce your total training volume and i think <clears throat> having that mindset that you don't need to empty the tank on every mm. set and every session is another distinguishing factor between bodybuilding and pure strength training yeah and i, I was going to move on to the second point but it got me thinking about something there where often we get told we want to do reps and reps and reps of exercises to ingrain the motor pattern to, so you get that fine tuning so you're getting down but that doesn't mean doing sets of 10 that means doing 10 yeah. sets of one so you're getting that consistency of a heavy movement pattern because you doing a 10 rep max a bench press or temp or whatever 10 rep max deadlift is i think it's a really easy one to think about doing 10 reps say touch and go or just doing say 10 reps without any thought about just getting you going one two three four five six seven nine ten doing that is not going to be conducive necessarily to building your one rep max strength however one rep reset one rep reset i'm not saying you need to let go of the bar you could still say hold of the bar but you then create the same tension 
lift it again yeah. this is why when I, i'm talking to clients and people about improving their strength i'd never really recommend touch and go reps i just i say it's great for building some volume in the muscles and stuff but that going say more bodybuilding focus but when you're looking to build absolute strength you want to try and do the same thing over and over again to make it replicable so when you're doing say a deadlift each time you're resetting at that floor creating the tension and lifting it so it's probably going to be about a five to seven seconds before you actually lift again because you're going through your lifting sequencing and that is how you're going to be able to start replicating and improving your top end strength because you are able to execute the same thing every single time and that's how you build top end strength is when you have confidence in your movement pattern without thinking it's automation yeah skill like i think a recurring theme through a few of these points is to treat strength training as skill training mm -hmm. the the efficiency and coordination component is massive so optimizing for skill development is one of the best ways we can improve our strength um yeah we'll come back to that yeah later on, I think. so point number two is speed of progression and <clears throat> what are your thoughts on this Ash? Yeah, so speed can be too fast, it can be too slow, but most commonly it's too fast. In that people <laughs> yeah. are trying to PB every session or trying to make big jumps from week to week. And one thing we say often is that the body likes consistency, it likes predictability, and it doesn't like system shocks. So if you start adding 20, 30% weight from one week to the next, the body's going to freak out, it's going to panic, and it's less likely to be able to adapt to that progression than if it's slow steady and consistent because then it kind of gets the message it knows what you're asking it to do and it can handle it which is the crucial part but you had a good story about session pbs versus mm. sticking to the plan yeah Share so a couple stuff. couple of weeks ago i was i was at where and i was squatting it was feeling really really good um i hit a really solid beltless back squat and i was like fuck like doesn't you feel like i feel like i've got the best belt on i haven't even got a belt on yet i'm feeling so strong and then hit um hit what i, I went in with the goal to hit I, th I think it was around 230 to 240 and i was like because obviously my max squat the competition was 240 so i was like I'm pr i can't remember i need to look it up but i either hit 240 or hit say 230 whatever it was and but i felt like i had so much more and my next goal at the next comp is 250 so i was like at that moment in time i was like i've got 250 in me like i, I feel like i've got it today i can grind it out I, ca I can hit what i want there but for the first time i actually stepped back i was like no no my goal today was to hit whatever i hit say 230 or 240 right that was my goal. I'm going to stick to the plan and trust myself that in four weeks time, eight weeks time, I'm going to hit that 250 and not grind it out. I'm going to hit that 250 and hit it rather than just about get it. And that was me then sticking to the plan of what I had in mind. However, that plan kind of went a little bit skew with when I then got ill and then now I've just about squatted 200 the other day. So not that I've lost all this strength, but... It's like, I, I, it then made me question, should I have taken that 250? And when you're looking at the macro picture of like November as my competition, was hitting that 250 a couple of weeks ago important? No, it would have been great for the ego, but that's about it. Whereas now, and then, I, and as you pointed out to me, it's like, it could have then actually made me iller and because I would have had poorer recovery, I would have been in more, so something else could have happened. Or maybe when I got back to some training afterwards, I then actually injured myself because I was still recovering from that nervous system wise. So it's, if you've got, a, this is why it's important to have a plan when you're training. It doesn't even have to be a, to the kilo plan, but it has, to, you have to have an idea of where your training is going so that you know when to kind of pull the brakes and when to push the accelerator. Like you need to be able to fluctuate between the two because sometimes you need to check the ego and say like, no, no, no the plan is this. So progression is yeah. like, it, it, it can feel hard to say no to something that you think is there and trusting in the process and having that delayed gratification and saying, no, no, I'm going to get it. I'm just not going to get it this week. Yeah, I think that's a great example for highlighting progressive overload and progressive is the key word in progressive mm. overload and the question that comes to mind then is if you hit 250 instead of 230 or 240 
would that have resulted in you being stronger on the platform in November? And I would argue no, in mm -hmm. that the, you've slowly and sensibly built up to hitting 230 or 240 in your plan. So that is a sensible progress, like speed of progression. And hitting that would have been heavier than you hit in the previous mm. version of that session. Yep. So you have achieved the goal of creating a strength training stimulus. So your body has a reason to adapt to get stronger. So that box is ticked. Mm. The box doesn't get more ticked <laughs> by adding another in 10 bold. 20 kilos. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so your, your body doesn't adapt significantly faster. It might adapt ever so slightly faster, but you are adding an element of risk, yeah. which compromises all the strength that you've built in the lead up to that. And the fact that you got sick afterwards is a shame, but mm. kind of doesn't really relate to the, the question on that day, you made the right decision. It's yeah. like in poker, you know, you might lose a hand, even if you do statistically the right thing to do, it doesn't change that that was the right decision. It's just, mm. you got unlucky. Yeah. So I think in terms of the common mistake with speed of progression, people try to go too fast. If you're getting stronger consistently over a, over a long period of time, your strength training is working. It's when people get greedy and try to get too much stronger too quickly that things start to go wrong. So in our, yeah, in our strength training episode, I think we, we talk about some rules of thumb, but generally 10% per week in volume or weight on the bar is a rough rule of thumb. There's always mm. big caveats around how long you've been training and, and the rest of it. But if you're moving in the right direction, just be grateful you're making progress rather than trying to push too hard too soon. Yeah, and I guess then this leads nicely into our next one as well with overall volume. So point number three, overall volume. And it can be really easy to kind of get stuck into the more reps equals better and or like more sets, more whatever is them going to get me stronger. And mm -hmm. I think I think an example of this with myself as of recently is when I, I've put, because I uh, heavy back squat and heavy deadlift in the same session, I found when I was building up, say, a heavy five for the day in the back squat and then building up to a heavy three in the deadlift, if I did a heavy five back squat and then did some back off volume based on what I hit for the day, my deadlift would be massively impacted because of the stress on the nervous system. So what I started to do, which I found was a lot more effective, was build up to, say, a heavy five back squat, build up to a heavy three deadlift, and then the back off volume comes later in the week. So I'm still getting the overall volume. I'm just placing it at a time where my body could recover better and I can have more of a focus. And I'd throw the squats on one day and the deadlifts on another day because I was then incorporating with other movements. So then they weren't too stressful in the body, but I was able to still stay specific by keeping the heavy squats and heavy deadlifts in the same day. Yeah, nice. So that, yeah, I think my notes on this say for overall volume, it's usually too high as the common mistake and especially within one session. So people trying to get too much of a strength stimulus and kind of like we touched on before, if you've ticked the box, challenge your body to get stronger, that's job done. And just further trying to destroy your body doesn't make you more stronger for next time. If anything, it creates more muscle damage. So it just takes you longer to recover. So you can't practice the skill of strength mm. as soon or as much overall during the week, like Rob's saying there, spreading the volume out over the week actually means he can do more training, even though he doesn't, he might not feel as wrecked in that one session, which I think goes back to that sort of bodybuilding and sometimes CrossFit mindset of you don't feel like you've had a session unless you're like ruined mm. and destroyed. But productive strength training doesn't need to do that to you. You can build your strength without completely writing yourself off. It's skill, it's practicing. So accumulating high quality reps with good weight, but not going close to failure is giving you a strength stimulus. So um, yeah, I think that's probably point number one is too much in one session. And in terms of overall volume, I mean, overall volume with other components of training. So the interference effect impacting your overall recovery capacity. So mm. you could be doing a powerlifting program plus a marathon program mm. plus a CrossFit gymnastics program. And we talked about this a lot from a recovery point of view, you've only got a certain amount of budget to spend. So if you're allocating that recovery budget across all those different things, that just means there's going to be less to allocate to your strength development. So if you want to get strong as fast as possible, 
you probably want to allocate more resources to your strength training, which probably means dialing down the other stuff. If you're solely focused on strength, if you are a CrossFit athlete, then obviously you have to keep the other stuff topped up, so, but you'll have to accept a slightly slower rate of strength progression to keep your other skills on the go. Yeah. And I think this, like when it comes into our next point of frequency is important because then like when I mentioned there, how uh, I mentioned a couple of points ago where I said like doing reps on reps, helping you build that skill of say the bench press or deadlift or whatever, having high frequency in the week, depending on the lift and loading is, is key. If you're, especially if you're trying to learn the skill and become more proficient at it, because the more you can touch base with it, the quicker you're going to get better at it. So that especially with something like the bench press, it's a really easy one that you can actually do more than you think. I, most most people that I train that are looking to say get stronger in the bench press will bench press at minimum twice a week. De most of them go towards three times a week, mainly because it's the recovery is, is a lot quicker because one the loading that's being used a lot of time is a lot less than say you would in a squat and a deadlift. But it just means that we can touch base with that movement because it's the bench press is such a skill in itself. I think people underestimate it. And we're going to mm -hmm. touch on a bit of this later on. But it's like there's so much nuance to finding your bench press technique that the more frequency we can get, the quicker you're going to find the one that works for you and the position that works for you best. So frequency is key. But as long as you've taken into consideration total loading that like total stress that you're going to put on your body through that week with that movement. I think a really good one to think about is the deadlift because mm -hmm. <clears throat> deadlifts can be, people can get really worried about the deadlift and say, Oh, how often should I deadlift or should, can I deadlift more than once a week? And it's like, you could deadlift, you could deadlift every day if you want it. It depends on the loading again. It's like the stress yep. in the body. But if you're looking at strength training and you're going to be pushing yourself closer to those top end numbers like the threes, the twos, the ones, you have to take into consideration how long is it going to take for my nervous system to recover. And a really good way to see is how good is your grip strength. That's a really mm. good indicator of how recovered are you. So deadlifting, it's very common for people to deadlift maybe once every two weeks, maybe even every three weeks and still be progressing in the deadlift. It's amazing how much your deadlift strength stays, especially if you're doing accessories like, you know, heavy Romanian deadlifts, um, all these other posterior focus, and even just squatting heavy. Like your mm. deadlift will maintain strength. So then you have to weigh up the consideration of maybe every two weeks is better because I can push myself every two weeks and I give myself two weeks to recover and I'm feeling that progression. But again, it's yeah. one of those type of things that when we touched on earlier with these individual caveats is in like, you have to try what does it feel like to deadlift once every two weeks or are you someone that actually needs to deadlift quite frequently because you just shit at deadlifting and you need yeah. to you need the skill more than you need the top end strength yeah great great caveating there because i think the deadlift isn't the interesting example and potentially more of the exception because it's so demanding on the nervous system if you're doing heavy deadlifts it can a lot of recovery before you're ready to do heavy deadlifts again but people who are deadlifting that heavy generally have quite a an old training age so they've been mm. deadlifting for a long time to be able to get strong enough to deadlift heavy enough to mm. write their nervous system off to that yeah. extent yeah. whereas the beginner or the novice strength training athlete probably can't lift heavy enough to write themselves off for two weeks or to not train again for two weeks mm. and they'll also lose the motor pattern faster because they're not so skilled, whereas the experienced lifter's got so many more reps already under their belt, so that their their motor pattern is pretty well ingrained. Whereas somebody, like you said, if their technique is shit and they're not actually very skilled at deadlifting, they're not going to lift as heavy, so they can lift more often. And I think for the common strength training mistake, not doing it often enough is probably the limiter, mm. um, more often than people doing it too often. And Big caveat again, this obviously needs to be sensibly progressed into. So if you've been squatting once a week and you suddenly go to five times a week, <laughs> then that's a huge, and the reps and the, the <laughs> intensity are similar, then yeah. Yeah, it's a recipe for disaster. So gradually ramping up the sessions per of each movement per week is the way to get there. Or if you do increase the frequency, reducing the intensity and spreading the volume across. So say you did five sets of 10 once a week, 50 reps 
you could spread those 50 reps across two or three sessions mm. of a similar intensity, or you could reduce the volume to keep the uh, um, intensity higher. So yeah. just having a consideration for not like progressive overload still matters, even if you're increasing the frequency, it still needs to be balanced. Yeah. And if you don't get me wrong, if you want to dabble with a squat every day program, by all means, be our guest because it it can really open up some new avenues for you to really start to think about because you can do this and it's not necessarily for yeah. a longevity thing. And you've, you've yeah. done it as well, haven't you, Ash? You've, you've, I haven't done squat every day. You've done well, you've done a lot of squatting times a week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. That for me, if you do want to dabble into the squat every day world, which can be really beneficial for someone to say an intermediate trainer, you want to do a little block of it for a couple of weeks, like say four, eight, 12 weeks have that in the back of your mind where there may be over the next say 12 weeks you're going to go to squatting twice a week then you go to squatting three times a week and then you can go to either four or you go all in at then five at that point but you've you've increased your tolerance so that your body is accustomed to higher volume squats because this is where most people go wrong with the say squat every day um, option is because they go right fuck it i'm going to do the squat every day program I'm squatting once a week. I want bigger legs. They do it and they go, fuck, this is too much squatting. I can't, I can barely go past week one. And it's like, it's just yeah. because you haven't given yourself the tolerance so far. Most people yeah. that are successful with that have come off normally three three times a week squatting and they go into that for a period. A really, It's not a longevity thing. This is like you do it for a block of say six to 12 weeks and just see what happens. And you will increase your squat at what cost? If you don't get injured, yeah. Yeah, the the injury <laughs> risk is very high. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you can put on some serious numbers because think about how good your squat becomes if you're squatting every yeah. single day. You are, uh, and this then could be a bit of a, an idea, even for someone that's quite, a, not a newbie necessarily, but an early intermediate because the load that they're going to be putting on the bar isn't going to be that high but they're then practicing the skill every single day. So actually it could be a quicker way to kind of get to skill acquisition, not necessarily to bigger squat number, which, well, it would be a bigger squat. Well, that would lead to bigger squat It numbers, would, yeah. so, but it's like, it's a way of doing it. But then I would argue, even I'm arguing myself with this point, is then I'd, I'd be worried that the, the novice mindset behind squat every day would then actually take it too far and actually then cause more damage. So it's, you if you were to think about doing this, definitely talk to, say, a coach, talk to Ash, talk to myself. Like, you know, we, we probably won't recommend you do it, but if you are interested in doing it, we could definitely talk to you and kind of give you an idea of how to kind of get to that because there is some, especially in squat on the bench press, two movements, which if you did every day, you know, under the right duress, I, I think, you know, That's you could, yeah, you, you could get some serious gains from it with the right, uh, with the right protocol so exactly that's the key uh, thing the intensity yeah. has to be appropriate like you yeah. can squat like you could air squat every day you know yeah. and that'd be fine but you couldn't one rep max every day no and if well, but if you are well, very long yeah but if you are trying to improve the skill acquisition of a one rep max style squat which is kind of what squat every day is it's that's a, that's a skill in itself like having the right mindset getting underneath a heavy barbell even if you're fatigued and how to do it and like that it's like when i've done the russian squat program which is three times a week squatting i absolutely loved it it's perfect it's done it's just the right amount of volume and it's you can do it with loads of stuff and by the end of week three you're finishing on six by six Right, at the same weight. So you've used the same weight for three weeks. You've got six by two, six by three, six by two, six by four, six by two, six by five, six by six. And then you always go back to a six by two to recover. By when you start getting to, I think, like three by threes, and then you've got to do six by two, you're like, this feels great. This was so light, but you've ingrained such a tight movement pattern with your 80% load. That you mm -hmm. just feel like that blew up my squat the first time I did that because I learned how to squat. I didn't have to squat every day to learn how to squat. Then I squatted three times a week and it just, it, it was great. So enough on frequency. I think yeah. that then goes into our next point of too much variance. So having too much variety in your strength training just fucks it up because then it means yeah. you're, you, you're trying to get stronger to too many things, which is essentially CrossFit, right? And this is when we've <laughs> we've touched on that point that you said, like you have to understand at what bucket are you filling up? Because you, you're going to have to say, some of them are going to have to be more on ticking over so the other can focus. And if you're focusing on strength, if you can 
if your measure of strength is say squat bench deadlift or whatever if you keep it tight to a certain select few things and that's where your training is focused on it means you're going to be able to get the most out of it and then pick the appropriate accessories to get the most out of those sessions yeah exactly and this comes back to that idea that strength is skill based and if we think of all our strength movements as the thing that we're measuring to get better at time spent doing other things are less directly carrying over to the core cornerstone movements like if you want to to hit a golf ball further or harder, you wouldn't go and play rugby. You know, like, it sounds so ridiculous, but that's kind of like the same principle behind people yeah. thinking that they want to get better at squatting. So they go and do like random other movements that have very little in common with squatting. Yeah. You want to stay pretty specific. So you get that skill development, you get that carry over. The higher up that spectrum of specificity we operate, the better bang for buck we get from our training. That's not to say there's not a business case for adding in smart accessories, targeting the limiter for your squat. So say there's a certain part of your body which isn't pulling its weight in the squat. Say you're not very good at using your glutes, you're not very good at using your quads. Having a squat-like movement that biases those muscle groups would be the best way to address that from an accessory point of view, rather than doing banded clamshells or something mm -hmm. like that you know what i mean that's a, yeah. that is technically going to use your glutes in a certain yeah. way but it's not very much like a squat so no. you can't expect huge carryover for your squat pattern um so being focused around the specific movements you want to get better and not straying too far from them would be the guidance against the common mistake of too much variance in your program yeah and then leading on to our last one of too strict on form or technically potentially incorrect form and that mm. is obviously in air quotations because what one person's incorrect form is someone's else form of how they lift something and you know it's just maybe how their body is positioned or wired up that they have to move if they're moving a barbell and they they shouldn't really be moving a barbell but they're a power lifter then they're going to look a certain way doing something which might not look like how you lift so yeah obviously when it comes to strict on form if we're talking about movement standards obviously we have to make sure that whatever it is challenges to its fullest range of motion required to complete the rep based on the movement standards but then when it comes to what that looks like is going to be very individual because using the deadlift as example i think it's very easy for the deadlift to kind of be well it's actually in both ways but i'd say it's very easy for it to be focused on being too strict is in your trying mm -hmm. everything's trying to stay compact and locked in and dead tight so that you're essentially like this little robot trying to pick up a weight in this really locked in position and not allowing the body to, and if the body moves it's like no i've gone wrong i fucked it up it's yeah. like so then whereas it's like and and i will and i will i will be i will honestly say that that has only physic that's only probably changed for me in the last I'd say year and a half to two years has been where my mindset has kind of shifted on the depressed shoulders and locked in lats like that to having a bit more of a protracted shoulder locked in still and understanding that the the different position was actually then a better position for me. And that's, yeah. that's the very big thing because it's like for me, I can create a much stronger upper back position with my shoulders protracted and i only found that out through experimentation of the movement so allowing myself to maybe do what's not necessarily on form correct and find out what does this feel like and not saying that's that that's level. how everyone should be but well i am <laughs> so in terms of strength and maximizing yeah. for strength that is anatomically stronger in yes. that you're not putting your shoulders in the position where they will yield to the weight you're lengthening the muscles of your upper back so it actually recruits better and you will structurally be able to lift more provided like i'm not saying that doing that tomorrow is going to give you a deadlift pb but if you've built up using that technique the potential for that technique is greater than the potential for a perfectly neutral spine deadlift from the textbook and this is one of the deviations we see from like perfect correct safe form in a yeah. pt textbook versus what powerlifters are breaking world records with and this is where you've got a decision to make about how important strength training is 
that there is a little bit more risk potentially if you're operating closer to your end range, but you will lift more because the muscles are allowed to give you more strength from other areas of the body. And now this is also when we're talking about science as say, I, I would say, I'd want to say simple, but as simple as a deadlift, because it is, you're literally just picking something up off the floor. So you're, you're utilizing your body in its, in its strongest form to get into the tightest position that you can to get up. And for me, that the reason why I still like to coach um, my athletes and stuff through the shoulders depressed and down so they can understand how to keep their, basically their back still. And because I understand how over the years of practice, how I can have my shoulders forward and down for the deadlift in particular, it's, it's been great. But then for instance, when I say do a Romanian deadlift, I have a bit more of a depression and slightly back because it's a better movement. And that's how with most of my say clients and stuff, when I'm coaching them, the hinge pattern, that's what I'm coaching them on. But when it comes to the deadlift per se, which I don't only train one person at the moment who's looking to obviously max out their deadlift, and it's something that we're gonna start to incorporate is more internal rotate, like more protraction of the shoulders to see where that can go for him because he's built up a good strong upper back and so forth. And it's it's funny though because it, what when I was when I when I was saying this, it got me thinking about say snatching and clean and jerk because it's it's pulling from the floor. If I try to snatch or clean jerk with my shoulders protracted, it would cause the barbell to travel forward and I would be in a terrible position. But then it made me wonder, like, but would I lift more and would I would I be able to correct and stabilize it overhead? Like, is that what everyone's missing? Are they missing yeah. protracted shoulders? <laughs> yeah, I don't I think it's it's a it's I'm gonna a try quite, it. Try it, mate, but I think it's a it's a different movement. It's Oh, it is. It's, I know a, that. It's, yeah. a, it's a long discussion to get into, but I would say thinking it more of a, of a leg press and obviously with a consideration to bar path, it's going to be very hard to be accurate with your bar path if you go from that deadlift yeah. hingey position rather than... Yeah, no, no, I know. It's just, I was just thinking, but even if I was in like, I'm just thinking about a clean and if I was in that, my clean grip position, everything, but maybe with internal, like, what does that look like? Does maybe the, how it comes off the floor, is it easier? Like, I, it's, this is just now me talking on air, just like a thought that's gone through my head. So I do apologize <laughs> about that, but because we're obviously talking about form, but it's because challenging the narrative is what it's about. It's about not necessarily saying that there's one way to do things. It's about finding your way. I know, but the thing is, is when you look at every single weightlifter, no one does it. So I'm pretty sure what I'm talking about is absolute bollocks. But <laughs> let's go on to the squat because I think that's yeah. that's Mr. Ash Grossman. That is <laughs> that is training stimulus 101. Knees out is a no. Yeah, yeah, it's a no. So like old school, hopefully old school now, coaching of pushing knees out while you're squatting will reduce your strength. Your yeah. We do a whole episode on this. I think it's one of the early ones. Episode on five. Knee valgus. Yeah. Um, check that out for a long detailed explanation. But essentially by driving your knees out, you block the ability to maximally recruit glute max, the biggest, strongest muscle in the body. And also your VMO is one of the major quad muscles. Um, so letting your knees go where they want provided it's controlled and you've built up that movement pattern progressively over time will result in stronger squats and this is what you see in all the world records for powerlifters yeah. all the world records for clean and jerk and snatch that the knees will have to dip in to get some knee valgus to get maximal recruitment of those big strong muscles so people are holding back their strength by hanging on to knees out and blocking maximal uh, muscle recruitment in the squat yeah and then lastly like with the press now this is one that we want to take a deeper dive into but just so we can touch on it lightly here i think too strict on form and taking something to the nth degree now when people say like so i keep those elbows tight when you bench press is is slightly correct it is correct because you do want your elbows slightly tucked but it's take it's kind of gone to an extreme where it's like a close grip bench press and they're trying to maintain the close grip bench press even on the way back up. And this is then where 
if there's any type of elbow flare, people are like, no, it's wrong. Like you need mm. to be staying tight. And it's like, personally for me, I class the elbow flares, the knee valgus of the upper body, because when you're thinking about the barbell and you're loading down, and I'm say using the bench press as the example, when I'm bringing the bar down to my chest, I'm gonna have a slight, if I imagine I'm gonna snap the bar in half, I'm gonna think about that loading down into the chest. I'm creating a, a spring essentially that's wanting to explode up. So then when I do come up, I'm not then trying to maintain those elbows in, I push up into the bench and the elbows kick out. So I've got a solid base to then finish off the movements and I've got all my upper back structure just fully engaged, ready for that lockout and the triceps can really hammer home their final movement, which is when those elbows are out, they can really, it's a lot easier to bring those elbows together, your inner arms together than it is to then keep them tight. Yeah, I love I love the analogy of the knee valgus of the upper body because it's almost exactly the same in that when people actually max out, the elbows naturally flare. Mm. So we are able to produce more force factually by letting the elbows flare. The other big clue about this is that everybody can bench press more than they can narrow grip bench press. So keeping the elbows tucked isn't as strong. And why do the elbows flare? The elbows flare to maximize muscle recruitment mm. and they find the position where they get more pec engagement. So the body knows where the strength is and it's just finding it by flaring. And big caveat to this is, again, this is the common pattern. We're not saying that everybody everybody's elbows are too tucked, but in terms of a common um, form, the form idea that is holding back people's numbers, trying to keep those elbows too tight is like driving your knees out and it's blocking your body's ability to tap into strength from big muscles and like we said last week in our shoulder episode um the pecs are one of the big strong mm. muscles that <clears throat> excuse me we want to be doing as much work as possible so yeah. letting those elbows flare towards not necessarily as much as possible but they have to have some flare to get that stretch reflex out the pecs but i think i think what's also really important here is like when we mentioned with knee valgus and is not putting the elbows or putting the knees where you want is allowing them to do what they want to naturally do and then dictate once they're already in motion say on the squat once they've kind of dropped in you're then pulling them back out to get everything switched back on as you stand so you're opening back up you're not necessarily finishing your squat off with the knees pressed in together you're thinking yeah. about you're thinking about standing up with that drive out and open up same as with the the bench press is in you're not actively thinking right elbows out because then your elbows will probably go out too early or they're going to be going out too late what i would recommend is if you load correctly on the way down the way up will happen like it's supposed to and to not be afraid of when those elbows kick out to think oh no i fucked it it's like no no this is how you finish off the bench press and when you look at a bench press the the motion of it is a bit of an arc it's not a straight up and down so it comes from say over the neck slash chin down to that like mid to lower chest to then come back up to there so naturally it's going to want to have those elbows out so it gets to a strong finished position so we've yeah, done the bench I, press deep dark, deep dark, haven't we have we i think so i think we have yeah i'm pretty sure we have so <clears throat> for me it's like the key thing i think the key takeaways from today obviously we've had our six six points which are the bodybuilding not strength training so having the mistake there between the two um, progressing too fast or too slow, nearly always too fast, having too much volume or sometimes not enough volume. So it's making sure you are getting the correct sort of amount there. Frequency, so we spoke about there, just making sure you're getting, if you're trying to learn a skill, obviously the more the better, but you then need to take in a, um, into consideration the overall volume point. And then obviously having too much variance is then just gonna cause too much confusion on what you're trying to get better at. And then lastly, finishing off with the form, either staying too strict with the form and then that's going to restrict your progression there because you're trying to stay too tight where your body doesn't want to stay there. So if you really want to optimize the movement, you need to find your way of performing the exercise. So I think as a, as a massive takeaway, you need to be understanding, tracking your numbers and making sure you've got numbers to be working off so that you know where you're going to. Because so if all you're doing is just pulling a number or whatever at your ass and just saying, I hit that, and there's no consistent monitoring of it, then how do you know if you're progressing or not? Yeah, 
exactly. I think that's that's sort of um, gym one hundred and one is track your progress, and then you'll be conscious of whether you actually plateau or how quickly you're progressing, whether it's an, an unsustainable pace or whether it's actually something that is sustainable and you can continue to get stronger at. Um, I think an overarching point for strength training in general is be clear in your priorities. Like how important is pure and absolute strength development or are you working other things at the same time? If you are working on other things at the same time, then accept some compromises in non-optimal strength training. In, for example, if you want to get bigger doing some bodybuilding, if you want to get fitter or better at other things like gymnastics, then acknowledge it and mm. accept that you're going to have a non direct path towards getting stronger. Um, and I think one of the key ones going back to the bodybuilding point is that failure isn't a good thing from a, a strength development point of view day in, day out. Like obviously, at certain points, it's appropriate to test your strength. But as we've said a lot of times before, testing your strength isn't necessarily the best way to build your strength. So getting the stimulus to get stronger is the goal of training sessions. And then at periodic intervals, testing mm. to find out where your limit is, is finding out where your limit is, but it's not necessarily what you should be doing if yeah. you want to just stimulate strength development. Yeah, def definitely not too frequently because at the end of the day, you should do it because you need to understand what it feels like to lift heavy loads because you might be in this sweet spot of around like 85 90 percent of your max is always always just right but then when you get to the big boy weights or big girl weights and you're starting to lift some things that are really going to take it out of you this is my issue at the moment with the deadlift i need to grow a pair for my deadlift because i could have finished up i get so frustrated when i look back at my 280 deadlift and i second time i now haven't hit it and i it's because I just didn't have a pair. I should have finished it. I should have held on to it. It's so annoying. But when I think back, it's like that's then me, point number six, staying too strict on form. Because then I was in my head, I had this contorted body which looked terrible. And I was like, I've got to let go. And when I look back on the video and stuff, it just wasn't. So, you know, this is, yeah. So for me, as you can tell, guys, I think like strength training is a massive passion of mine. And it's, I, it's it's such a shame when you see people that want to get stronger but they get distracted because it's it because it's such a, a long-term thing like a marathon it's it's not a quick win and if because if you do try and get the quick wins all the time you don't get stronger quickly and that's the thing because that's when we go back to the session pbs if we you're always trying to get stronger stronger in that session it's like you need to think big picture and that's why i do love strength training because for me it's always like a, a staple in my training that i have my three fundamentals of squat bench and deadlift that each week i try and progress and everything else on top of that is for fun that's that's just how my training is now so but guys we really hope you enjoyed today's episode and you were able to pull some of those points out maybe if it's just the one and it's going to hopefully unlock your strength training if you do think it helped you and you think it helped it others do share it with them you know maybe share it on your social media tag us at lunch.lift we would love that if you did also think it's really beneficial and you want to learn even more about lunge and lift you can head over to our youtube subscribe there and find our videos from all our previous episodes but as always thank you very much for your time we really do appreciate it you know it's a growing audience which we do not take for granted so thank you very much and we'll see you next week thanks guys